YouTube channel so welcome to everyone brand new here and I'm here with a new series as well which I will be continuing after today and so this will be a series where we have some tea we bake something sweet and we talk about books so hopefully this is a fun series for all of you um, it's definitely fun for me and I'm excited uh, to start today so today I will be talking about the Little House series by Laura Ingalls Wilder and I have all my books here, a giant book stack. Uh, you can see that. And I have made a strawberry pie for today. And uh, so I'm sure you've seen in earlier clips, but I'll show you my, my piece. It's kind of messy on the plate, but we'll go ahead and try it before we start talking about books. Um, every time I bake something just for um, all of you to know, I can't eat gluten or dairy, so everything I bake is gluten-free and dairy-free, so that might be um, heartening to some of you out there um, that also have, you know, food limitations that you can make sweet things, and that's what I've been enjoying about baking lately, because I'm not really a very good cook, but I've been baking a lot lately because not only is it fun, but it enables me to, like, have little treats that I really haven't been able to have in so long, so it's fun. So gluten dairy free pie um and yeah it is a little bit messy it was kind of hard to make the crust but yes with strawberry pie uh, which i thought was perfect for spring so let's go ahead and try a little bit before we start talking about books some strawberries mm. it's definitely sweet <laughs> i had to chill it for a while, I had to cool it down and then chill it before um, being able to eat it because the strawberries were like really watery and stuff. And then I also have some tea as well, um, some peppermint tea. I pretty much only drink peppermint tea, so I guess that's not very exciting. But it is what I like to drink. And so if you're watching, grab yourself, you know, some tea or some coffee, um, maybe grab something sweet or a snack. And if you want to go all out, you know, bake something too. And we can all like have a little nice um, tea time and chat together. So, um, Little House on the Prairie. I read these books when I was a kid and they were some of my favorites. And I've always wanted to reread them as an adult. I think it's really fun rereading some of your favorite books um, um, later on in life, you know, that you enjoyed so much as a child because you get such a different perspective. And I kept wanting to do it, but um, I didn't have my books anymore from childhood. And then my dad, not too long ago, happened to find um, some of my childhood books, including this series. And so that's what prompted me. I was like, okay, it's time to reread the Little House series. So I went ahead and did that. And um, the Little House series um, was written by Laura Ingalls Wilder in the 30s and the 40s, mostly. But she was writing about her family's real life as American pioneers um, in the late 1800s, like the eight, 1870s and 1880s specifically. And so these books are so cool because they are, you know, real life stories of uh, a family during that time period. And so it's like these first hand accounts of what life was like back then and that is really special because she writes them like fiction books but we know that Laura really experienced this life and it's really cool to see um, her and her family's life. And she did write these for children. I don't know if that was her original intention or if the publisher encouraged her to um, change them to be more for children. I'm not sure. And while sometimes the writing is simple, I will say as the series goes on, it gets more descriptive and more beautiful. Um, and I do think there's a lot to appreciate as an adult. Like I loved these as a child, but I think I appreciated them more as an adult. And a lot of the books Laura is 
you know, a child. But towards the end, um, especially the last two books, she's getting older. And um, the last book, she's married, she has her first child, and then the book before that, she's working, she's left home for the first time and um, she gets courted by her future husband so there's um, events to appreciate more as an adult um, than as a child so it does follow her for quite a lengthy period in her life um, yeah so i think that's all i wanted to say about the series in general and i thought we would talk about um each book individually so um we'll start with Little House in the Big Woods. And um, this one, I will say, I didn't actually read this recently, so I did have the idea to reread the series a few years ago when I came across this in a used bookstore. And so I read this one and then kind of gave up the idea. And so then in the past few months, I've been rereading the rest of the series since I got my childhood books back. And so I haven't read them all back to back, but I've kind of interspersed them throughout my other reading. Um, yeah, so this one I might not remember as much as uh, the other books. But in this one, we start out in Wisconsin and the Ingalls family live in a cabin in the woods. And Laura's very little, I don't know if it says how old she is, but she's really, really little in this one. And so it's probably the most simple of the series. And it kind of just details their life in the woods. They do live near some of their other family members. So you see a glimpse um, into that. And yeah, it's just kind of about their little cozy home life. And I will say it is a very cozy book. And in its simplicity, I remember really enjoying uh, rereading this one. And then the second one. So this one I did reread recently, and this is, you know, the most famous of all of them, Little House on the Prairie. And to start off about this book, this brings up something about pioneers that we can't really, um, like we can't talk about pioneers without bringing this issue up and that is the fact that while the pioneers were admirable in some ways you know the western part of the U.S. would not have been settled without them and living in the western part of the U.S. in California I acknowledge that and a lot of these individual people and families like the Ingalls family were very resilient and very adventurous people but this land got settled by pushing out the native people, the Native Americans. And so we kind of can't talk about pioneers without talking about this problem and this, yeah, just kind of this horrible thing rooted in history. And this book um, really reminds us of that. The other ones, not so much, but this one definitely touches on that and reminds you of that point. So as much as I love to focus on the positive things in history and the positive parts of the pioneers in particular with this series, I can never, you know, forget that the way we settled the land, it was just wrong. You know, there were other people here first, but unfortunately this is a pattern that has, you know, happened across history and in different countries where, you know, one people pushes out another, um, you know, to be able to have their land or to settle their land. And so we must remember that, you know, like we can admire people in certain points of history, but we shouldn't glorify it to the point of forgetting, you know, the kind of wrong, I guess, and, and sad story behind it and, and the history behind it. And so uh, getting back to the plot, A Little House on the Prairie, this is when the Ingalls family decides to set out west and to become pioneers. And so part of this novel, you know, they're traveling in their um, little covered wagon and they end up in Kansas and that's where Pa decides to build them a house. And so a lot of this book is just kind of about how Pa builds the house, how he builds a well. Um, about the food mom makes, how they set up house, that's pretty much like um, the whole thing. Although I appreciate that a lot as an adult, just like 
yeah, everything it took to create this life out on the prairie, out in the middle of nowhere. And I found that really interesting, you know, and, and maybe that went over my head a bit as a kid. I didn't appreciate that so much. And so that was really nice to see. Um, the thing is, the place that Pa has built his cabin, although at first he was told it was okay, um, was land reserved for the Native Americans, or what they called back then Indian Territory. And so at the end of a year, um, the government asked Pa to leave, and um, they do leave. And I was, I was glad of that, you know, I was like, okay, good, yeah, that's not your lands, like, I love you, Ingalls family, but let's move on. And so that was kind of interesting, and because this was the Native Americans territory, they do have a lot of run-ins with the Native Americans in this one. And while there's a couple throughout the rest of the books, this is the one where it really happens, and you kind of see the attitudes towards the Native Americans at the time. And some people, you know, might think that a problematic part of this book, in fact, I, I know they do, and, and some places ban this book because of it, although I do think it is an interesting learning experience because you see firsthand, you know, what was going on. Like I said, you're reminded of, um, the land that the pioneers were, were taking. And a lot of the times as individuals, it was unintentional, it was more the government. And um, and then you get to see firsthand the actual attitudes of the people from that time towards the Native Americans. And they vary. Um, I will say, Laura paints her, her neighbors, they don't really have close neighbors, but there's a few people that live, you know, not terribly far, I suppose, from them. Also other pioneers. And Laura paints their attitudes towards the Native Americans as pretty bad and, and pretty racist and very intolerant. Um, she does say that her ma is scared of them, which perhaps makes sense. Um, she's a woman. She was left alone out there sometimes when Pa had to go away for something. And so just sort of, you know, strangers in general, I guess, no matter who they are, can, can be frightening in that situation too. Like a young mother with, with children or, or to women, like, I guess you could understand that. I don't, I don't know how necessarily intolerant she was. She was more just scared. Um, but she does paint her pa as being pretty tolerant. I mean, his views are not perfect. I don't think anybody's views were perfect towards the Native Americans in this book, but Laura does paint her pa as being more understanding and tolerant and finds the good in them. And so that was at least nice to see. Um, but definitely her neighbor's perspectives was horrifying. And so, yeah, so that issue comes up a lot in this book. And, and again, I think it's an interesting learning experience, but some people, um, especially if they're introducing these books to their children, people have different views and some people want to tread more cautiously, some people could use this as a learning experience, um, but yeah, perhaps they do want to, if they're going to put this book into the hands of children or something, perhaps they want to have a discussion about it with their kids so it can be like an interesting historical lesson and, um, and something like that. Like, that's always the way I would go about things because that's definitely what I got out of it. Um, so yeah, interesting, um, interesting for sure. So this book, you know, was the one that showed more of the problematic sides of the pioneers, but also a lot of interesting stuff about them setting up house and all of that. So, so yeah, they only stay in Kansas for a year. And then we kind of changed directions completely with Farmer Boy. And I'm not actually sure when Laura wrote this because... Um, she may have written this before A Little House on the Prairie or after, but I read it afterwards um, because this is actually about her future husband, <laughs> um, Almanzo, and his childhood in upstate New York. And so I guess you could read this at any point because it's just kind of a detour from Laura's life. And this was really fun to read. I don't think I like this one as a kid. I think that's because it was about a boy. So I must have just resonated more with Laura and, um, and her sisters. Um, yeah, and so if you don't know, I guess I didn't talk about the Ingalls family, but um, Laura has an older sister, Mary, and then eventually a younger sister, Carrie, and then eventually another younger sister, Grace. So they're all girls. And so then moving on to Farmer Boy and Almanzo, 
Um, I think as a kid, I just um, didn't resonate with him. I wanted, I wanted a female. Um, but I really appreciate this one as an adult, and I thought this one was a really fun one, and I'm glad um, to have reread it and to actually appreciate it. So Almanzo grew up in upstate New York on rather a wealthy farm, and so his life is very different from Laura's upbringing. He still works very hard. His entire family works very hard. You know, the life of farmers wasn't easy, but they just have more abundance than the Ingalls family. You know, they have more stability. They haven't chosen to be pioneers. And so you basically just see their whole farm life. And his family is really lovely. I loved reading about their family life. And um, there was always lots of good food in here. Um, I feel like Laura was kind of jealous of Almanzo's childhood and all the delicious food he ate because, um, you know, the Ingalls family being pioneers didn't have this kind of food. Um, and so there's like so many food descriptions that make you almost hungry reading this book. And uh, yeah, so Almanzo's life was just easier but still a lot of hard work and I still admired the resourcefulness of his family on this farm because yeah back then on a farm it's like nothing ever went to waste they use everything and they have all these just wonderful ideas of how to utilize the land and just everything that they do happen to have and I feel like it could be a lesson um to us in today's world to um like we're so we're so wasteful compared to how they were back then you know um we just forget about all these types of things and so it's kind of nice reading about a family um like this and then we return to the Ingalls family with on the banks of plum creek and so in this one i believe they go to minnesota yeah so in this one they moved to minnesota and they have two different homes in minnesota one is a house of sod, like built into a hillside, and so it reminds me of like a hobbit hole. So they basically lived in a hobbit hole. And then Pa eventually builds them like a cabin or a house. And this one was fun. It, it was fun reading about lore exploring, you know, along the creek and in nature and all of that. There is a town nearby, so this is where the girls go to school for the first time. And this one did have a lot of hardship though. This is when you see a lot of the hardships about living on the prairie. Um, in particular, there's like this grasshopper storm that just sounds horrifying that eats all their crops that they needed for money. And so that gets them in a lot of trouble and just, again, sounds horrible. And then there's a blizzard pocket stuck in and somehow manages to survive. So, this is when you know they're really coming up against the elements and you see the struggles of the Ingalls family because really throughout the series they grow through a lot of hardship like they were really resilient people they led such a hard life really and i i will say that the father and mother you know mom and pa they really kept this family going this life you know Ma on the home front and then pa you know in all the other ways but they deal with so much and they still always manage to take care of their family and create a cozy home and to love their children and so I just think that they were such admirable people and parents you know they went through just so much and um, and lived a hard life but it seems like from Laura's perspective that she did enjoy this life and she appreciated her family life and so that's really nice to see. And then, by the shores of Silver Lake, they move to South Dakota. And they're not there at the beginning, I think they're kind of, um, well, maybe they're in South Dakota, but they don't quite settle down yet. Anyways, uh, Pa gets a job for a railroad company, and so they end up living in a railroad camp for a while. And, um, and they take a train for the first time, which is really fun to see. And just the life in the railroad camp was quite different than their life um, elsewhere and those are the parts that seem so much like the wild west like you don't in the other books you don't really get that wild west feel and i really enjoyed this one because of that wild west feel and the sense of like lawlessness out on those prairies there are some things that come up that paul has to deal with um 
because there's no sheriff, you know. At one point someone pretends to be a sheriff because they need some sense of law for an issue they're having but they don't have one because you know it's the prairies it's unsettled land um so that was kind of exciting and, and different i suppose and then uh pa ends up being one of the founders of the town of dismet and he strikes a claim i think that's uh what you say and so they decide to settle down here and Ma really wants to do that. She really wants this, the girls to be able to go to school. She wants them to have a stable life, but you see that's difficult for Pa because he just has this adventurous wild spirit and he just wants to keep going west and I think it was interesting. And this one, Laura, seems not so young anymore, you know, I want to say maybe she was like 12 or something in this one, I can't quite remember. Um, but the description, first of all, in this book, it's really lovely and she just seems to think more for herself and to realize what her parents are feeling more. You know, she thinks outside of herself as well. And so she realizes that Paul has this free spirit and she feels similarly to him. She finds a kindred spirit in her Pa and she knows that both of them just want to keep roaming forever, always exploring new places. Um, but she also sees that her mom wants what's best for all of them, and, and so she understands that too. Um, this is also the book where her sister Mary goes blind, and Laura always seems like such a good sport to Mary. They seem so close, and she kind of becomes Mary's eyes, and I think that's why this book got so descriptive, because Laura had to be Mary's eyes, and she had to describe what was going on um for mary and so that was so lovely like this book really had such beautiful description and just her descriptions of the prairie and just this land that you know to them or at that point was unsettled and just this you know empty and and just what that felt like and looked like laura really taps into that and it makes you want to be there and gives you such a this feeling of just vastness and freedom and I really en enjoyed that aspect to this book. In fact, I think this is one of my favorite of the rereads, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, just I feel like this book had more adventure to it and beautiful description and just really captured the sense of what it was like to be a pioneer and yeah, and this freedom that came with that and of these unexplored places and the types of people that the Ingalls family were to want to live this life and, and it helps you understand them and I liked that a lot. So, and like I said, just the Wild West feel of this book was kind of fun too because other ones don't really feel like that. So I really, really enjoyed this one. Then we have the most brutal in the series, uh, The Long Winter. So they're still in Dismet, South Dakota. Um, they're getting a little bit more settled. Um, the house in their claim is just a shanty and so the Angles family can't stay there for the winter. And so Pa, because he helped found the town, owns one of the storefront buildings and I don't think it's rented out to anybody. So they decide to move to this new town this new growing town of Dismet for the winter. And it ends up being one of the longest, most brutal winters for the whole town. I mean, just absolutely horrible. And because trains are new, and because this is a new town, the trains end up not being able to get to them to bring them supplies. And so to see the resourcefulness of these people and what they come up with was just insane. And so, they don't, there's no coal to burn because they, the train didn't get through. There's no wood to burn because there aren't any trees. And so Pa ends up like making these logs of hay that burn very quickly. So basically him and like one of his daughters, like Laura, has to work at it all day to be able to make them, to keep them warm enough to survive, which again, is just crazy. 
and they end up running really low on kerosene for their lamp because the train can't get through and so I have to go to bed early and they really really start growing, uh, running low on food. I think at one point they were only eating potatoes and bread and then at the very end like only bread like I just I don't know how they did it. Um, so they almost, you know, were starving. And what's really cool is Almanzo, um, Laura's future husband, makes an appearance in this one. So we hadn't seen him since his childhood, kind of just uh, in upstate New York. But him and his brother Royal end up moving to South Dakota. And that's how he meets Laura, because he also lives in this town of Dismet. And him and one other um, young man ends up um, saving the town from starving. And I think it's because they go and find some wheat or something like that um, that, they've, that they've heard of. Um, that someone has way out where, you know. So they risk everything, you know, in the cold and the snow. And... They go and bring that for the town, and yeah, they save the town from starving. So that was really cool. That uh, made me like Almanzo a little bit more as we get to know him. And yeah, so just to stay alive and to function and stay warm and eat, like, it was such a struggle in this book, and I can't believe that they made it through. And I do think the Ingalls family seemed so cohesive and so you know, able to work together to make the best of things. And I think that's how they got through it. And and um, I definitely think that quality of their family that Laura writes about really shines through in their hardest moments, like in this book. So this one was kind of just all difficult to read, you know, and sometimes it did feel, none of these books are boring, I will say that, but sometimes this one could feel a little bit monotonous because, you know, they're always stuck inside with the snow. But, um, what that did was just kind of show the feeling of this long winter, you know, and it was only in such a way that I definitely didn't find boring, but just brought home the fact that this winter just lasted forever, you know, so, so that was this one, the most brutal. And then we have a little town on the prairie, and my copy is a little bit battered. This reminded me of like, I don't know, childhood memory or something. I believe one of my dogs stole my book. Um, and bit into it, so there's like bite marks and tape, so I don't know, all the other ones are in pretty good shape, but this one kind of reminded me of, of that incident. So anyways, Laura's starting to grow up in this one. She's a teenager, so we don't get just a childish perspective anymore. We start to get a little bit of an older Laura, and once again, they, the Ingalls family, decides to come to town during the winters and so this book mostly chronicles the time that they spend in the town um, during the winter and so uh, there's a lot of Laura going to school she's trying to take school very seriously because she wants to become a school teacher so that she can help pay for her older sister Mary to be able to go to a school for the blind so she starts taking the school very seriously you know she worries about school um, you see her worry about her looks a little bit and some very like more teenage um, things. There's a lot more socializing in this book. Laura makes friends at school and there's just a lot of social activities. Um, not just that she goes to but also her family because they're in town and everyone's sort of coming up with all these ideas and, and whatnot. Um, so. So that was fun and different, although I miss like the nature descriptions and um, and stuff in this one. So, so yeah, I enjoy this. I think Almanzo starts to take um, notice of Laura for this one as well. She's very naive about it and it's nothing too serious yet, but he does start to. And uh, yeah, so this was an enjoyable one and definitely would say is the book that marks like her teenage years. Oh, I will mention... Um, this is a book that brought up something a little bit problematic, again, for today's day and age. It was, you know, didn't take up, you know, much of the book. It was just a scene. Um, but there was a scene where 
the town is putting on an entertainment and some of the men dress up in blackface. As of course, in today's day and age and, and with us just knowing better now, that is just not okay. Um, and it was not ill-intentioned in the book or Laura writing about it, but obviously, um, yeah, not okay. So that that is in this book. And uh, I will say, reading classics, I'm surprised at how much people of the past um, use that for humor. It's like, I can't believe that they just didn't have anything better, you know, to find funny. Um, like, they just um, had to be <laughs> racist to be funny, um, unfortunately. So that's kind of an unfortunate little scene in this book that is problematic and outdated and might bother some people. So I do want to mention that, again, it could be used as a learning experience as why that's not good, but perhaps um, needs like a preface to it, um, especially for like a child to, to not think that's okay. Um, but yeah, it is a small scene, but definitely you know, this happens with classics, you know, there, there are things that thankfully we don't do anymore that are not okay, and that was one of them. Okay, and then we have these happy golden years, and I think between this one and By the Shores of Silver Lake are my favorite, to be honest. Remember as a kid, I always said this was my favorite, although I don't know why, because I feel like, um, Laura's older in this one, and I feel like I appreciate this a lot more now, so I don't know why it appealed to me so much as a child. Um, I think I liked that Laura was a school teacher, and maybe I liked her romance with Elmon, so I guess it was just always the romantic. Um, anyway, so Laura, she's getting older. She now needs to make money, so she teaches school. And the first school that she teaches at, she has to stay at... Um, a different in a different town with a different family she can't stay at home and this is so rough because this family is like horrible like they are not happy people the wife is kind of crazy and you can just tell it's so difficult for Laura to stay there but she doesn't want to stop because she wants to make this money for Mary so she doesn't tell anyone about the struggle she's having um, and it makes her appreciate how kind her own family is, how they're always nice to each other, how there's always a cozy, friendly atmosphere at her home. And so Laura really appreciates that though she comes from a humble background, that she was really lucky and she had a really nice home, a really good family. And yeah, so that was just hard and, and kind of sad to see. But the saving grace with that is that um, Almanzo starts to court Laura more, and he just does such a wonderful thing. He comes out in his sleigh every weekend to take Laura home when she's teaching this school, and he doesn't have to do that. There's nothing in it for him, but he goes that way so that she can be with her family, and Laura is very innocent and naive, and does not really know Almanzo's interest in her, and, and she sometimes, you know, at one point, she kind of told them, like, he didn't have to do that. There was nothing in it for him, um, very bluntly. But he does it anyways, and I think that made me really like Almanzo as a partner for Laura because that was just such a kind gesture, and he's just so patient with her, and, um, and after she stops teaching the school, he goes out with her all the time on sleigh rides and buggy rides, and he doesn't ever push her, like, for a long time that's all it is. They just go on these lovely rides and enjoy each other's company. And and um, I think he knows the whole time he wants to marry her. And it's this quiet kind of love that's just so patient um, that I just thought was so admirable. And it's not a kind of love you see very often, but I really think it made Almanzo just seem like such a wonderful guy. And, um, yeah, and just, and like I said, it was the taking her home from school on the weekends that just really did it for me. It was like, that is just such a kind gesture. Um, like, what a good guy, you know. And, um, at the very end, Lord does catch on that, um, he wants something more. And they do end up getting married. And I think at the very end of the book, they get married and move out to their new home. And... 
And again, their love is very quiet on both sides. And at one point, her sister Mary is visiting and she asks Laura, why do you have to get married? Like, why are you marrying him? And Laura says, well, I think we just belong together. And that was really nice. Like, they never express these overly romantic things, but they do seem like they were made for each other and like good partners and a good team. And I uh, really liked that. And then the last book in the series is The First Four Years, and this was actually published after Laura's death, so not until 1971 was this manuscript found and then published, and they didn't edit it, so it seems a bit different than her other books. And um, this is about her first four years married to Almanzo. And I definitely didn't appreciate this one as a child, and for good reason. I definitely think this is the book that adults would just obviously resonate more with and understand more. And the tone of it was a bit uh, more blunt. I do think the descriptions were still beautiful, but Laura was a bit more bluntly herself, perhaps. And what was kind of weird or jarring was that the scene from the end of these happy golden years leading up to them getting married was in this book but like written in a different way and it definitely seemed a bit um yeah like less romanticized i suppose like laura is very blunt with almanzo because he wants to be a farmer and she's like i don't know like i want to marry you but i don't know if i could be a farmer's wife and he's like we'll just give it a few years just try it um and and she does and they do kind of have a hard time of it on the farm. You know, uh, once again, they deal with a lot of hardships. Um, more harsh winters. So many harsh winters in these books. Um, their crops keep dying, which puts them in financial hardship. Um, there's some sort of windstorm, which I think was a tornado that was incredibly harsh. Um, yeah, there was another event that I don't know if it would be like a spoiler to mention, so I won't, but Laura goes through something difficult. And it's almost like there's so much happening, she just sort of almost glazes over it, like she just can't process it all, or it almost seems a bit nonchalant, which was kind of weird because it seemed like such a sad thing. Um, but there are happy moments as well. Um, I think Laura enjoys keeping her own home. She gives birth to a daughter, Rose, and she seems to adore her. And it, her and Almanzo still on the weekends or on free days still go on the buggy rides and sleigh rides, which is nice to see if they keep up. And yeah, their relationship again never seemed overly romantic, but Almanzo seems like such a good person and they just really seem like they make it work together. Just this friendship and this partnership and um, I always tend to be such a romantic person, but I think this is the first time reading about a relationship that doesn't seem overly romantic, not that there aren't certain things about it that weren't, um, that I really admired and really saw the longevity of it and just how this was a partnership that, you know, in real life could really work out. And so I, I just really enjoy reading about them, honestly. Um, yeah, so those were all my thoughts on rereading the Little House series. And again, I really enjoyed rereading them. Uh, I do think I enjoyed them more as an adult, even though I loved them as a child. I just think I appreciated um, everything they went through um, as a family and even Laura when she goes off on her own. Um, in a way that I couldn't appreciate as a child and like I said it's not without its problems but that goes for a lot of classics and um, I'm always a believer that that's how we learn from things you know we read these old things and we take the good with the bad and we just always remember both and see the mistakes and learn from them and then see the good and, and appreciate that and carry that through in our own life because back then you know they they did some good things that you know we don't continue in the here and now like i said about farmer boy um they just used everything they had and were so resourceful and just you know in today's fast-paced world we're not like that and i and i think we could take something 
you know, from the past and, and these simpler days when they just appreciated what they had, nothing went to waste, you know, those are some nice qualities. So, so yeah, and again, my favorite books, I definitely think of my reread were By the Shores of Silver Lake and These Happy Golden Years. And uh, These Happy Golden Years apparently was always my favorite, so I don't know why. Um, but I guess that has remained true. And then I found that a couple books such as Farmer Boy and the first four years were more enjoyable than I had thought as a child. Um, so yeah, so it was a wonderful experience rereading these. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed this video in the beginning of this new series of having tea and sweet things and talking about books. And so I'll see you all soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye.